Hey there, Joe. Hi, so quiet. We are. It's going away. Um, is Daisy here? I she wasn't here last week. I didn't record her attendance, so I just need to know if the dog is around today for the meeting. Like, she so see a cat. <laughs> a cat and say. Daisy. Ah, yes, she's here. Oh, good. Hey, Daisy. Ah. We had a storm front come in. Mm -hmm. She There's, doesn't like storms. Some dogs are like super not good with like just like thunder and lightning. It's too spooky. Yep, she's my barometer. Does she like um? I guess she probably doesn't do well with like fireworks and stuff either. No. no yeah. No. Yeah. Poor pupper. For a first second, I'm like Daisy. Who's Daisy? <laughs> oh yeah. <Your> <laughs> You're not used to to people asking about your dog and open source yeah. meetings. I, I was thinking the same thing, Mike. I was like, is this another LF person I don't remember that we haven't been introduced mm -hmm. to yet? No, I just I just really feel like pets of open source need recognition for all the support that they provide. That's all. Yep. Or you know, plants, if you've got a plant or you know, whatever. That's a really nice, like, was it a ficus behind you, Marcin? Or is it a, a kind of like a ficus looking tree? I have no idea what is that, to be honest. <laughs> it's just my my wife's plant, and I'm okay with that. Is that a sunny corner of the house right there? Yeah. Well, we're at five after. Got a decent turnout today. Marcena, through um, the image compatibility working group, a quick update on that one as the first item, thinking mostly that I wanted to announce that we did go through our quick proposals on our meeting on Monday and put those on the recording. So for anybody that wants to look over those, it's only about 10 minutes of recording to listen to. We were, both of us were pretty quick about it. So if anybody has questions, comments, wants to review the proposals with some context, that is all out there to look at. And those are linked over in the Slack. Did I miss anything, uh, Marcin? No, I just want to add a comment that I would say it's quite important to get feedback of maintenance right now, because if we go too far with some directions and you are saying uh, that we should stop at some point with something, then we are just going to waste our time. So if you if you have time, please take a look. It's just 10 minutes, as Brandon said. Yeah, I think the, the biggest question we're looking at right now is whether it makes sense to have an external artifact in addition to patching stuff inside of the index itself next, um, in the descriptor of the each entry. So if folks think that that is OK to have a separate artifact defined by OCI, then that's good to know. And if folks think that it's something we don't want to support and maintain, then that's also important to know. All right, with that, um, I've put a couple of fillers in there for us to chat about, but otherwise this is all just kind of looking over the backlog of PR sitting out there and things to chat about. So if anybody has other stuff, feel free to interject 
but otherwise I will just kind of start uh, digging through some of the old backlog. <clears throat> and I'm just taking a second here to find the right window to share here. There we go. Pretty sure, yeah, that looks like the right window. So first one I picked on was an old one from VBETS, um, which sad that he's not hanging around here any longer, but he is, he had worked on a maintainer's guide a long time ago. And I think the part we were stumbling on was how to handle a scenario if we ever have multiple maintainers simultaneously go inactive and how do we handle the two thirds quorum in that scenario? How do you count the quorum when there are enough maintainers inactive that you can't get quorum anymore? Because I think everything else that he had put inside of this, and I'll actually link this over as well. Everything else in his PR I thought was pretty decent. It's been a bit since I read it, but he was pulling this one off with some of the other discussions that we were having. So can't be that bad. All my windows are moving around on me, so it takes me a second to find things. We're going to have to revamp who the people are that are going to be maintaining or uh, approving this. But yeah, the general idea was just kind of get some of the maintainer guidelines written down. And this was for image spec. I feel like this makes sense for various repos. Doesn't have to be just image spec. He was copying it from the, was it run C or runtime spec? One of those, he copied it from, he said, um, run C. So feel like whatever we do for here makes sense for a lot of the different specs that we're working on. And just kind of gives some guidelines on maintainers. And I think this, it caught my attention because we were having the conversation last week about when do we need quorum. And I feel like some of those discussions might be good to include in here as well of when do we need just the two maintainers? When do we need quorum? When do we, is it acceptable if you only have two maintainers? Um, two LGTMs in there. Um, the question Tianan and Cypher were chatting about was what happens when it's a maintainer that is submitting the PR? Do you need two additional reviews? I think that's the way GitHub currently forces us down that path, but that then turns into three maintainers at that point. So does that need to be captured in here? Do we need to have an exception to the GitHub policy? Um, things to think about. Considering he submitted this, flip over the other tab on you guys. Considering this was back in August of 2022, I can understand if folks haven't read this in a while. In general, what do folks think about? how we would want to deal with multiple maintainers that suddenly go inactive simultaneously. Is that something you think makes sense to have a written policy of if a maintainer doesn't respond within X amount of time, they're considered inactive and not counted in the quorum? What would that X amount of time be? Does this have to go up to the TOB to break any of those kind of deadlock scenarios? I think it depends, personally, right? Um, as you're mentioning, it depends on the cycle. It depends on if it's a de minimis issue. Um, is, do we have a really you know breaking problem that has to be resolved in urgent CVE, for example? It's not quite the same as a, uh, like we'd like to talk about a new feature, right? Um, I also think it's it's valid for the maintainers to have different rules per project. 
you know, run C is an active application. Um, it's not going to have the same rules, right? Um, as, as a trailing spec, right? Yeah, I, I was thinking that some kind of guideline here, documentation on how we handle this would make sense across the specs. Um, I know he pulled it from run C itself, but. Yeah, I think I think it's a good argument to make that each project should certainly make public how their decision process is being made, um, especially with regard to merging, right? Whether or not uh, merges must be, you know, two maintainers, not the, you know, I don't think I don't like self LGTMs <laughs> um, personally, but again, that's that's me, and you know we may have a smaller sub project in open containers um, where that's perfectly valid, right? Where really most of the code is just one person, and we're using a valid you know validation as a, a second party, right? A side effect I've seen from that is I've seen issues where if a maintainer thinks there's going to be any kind of difficulty getting things in, they'll find a proxy and they'll get a proxy to submit the PR. That way one maintainer, they just got to get, find one other maintainer of like mine to get something merged. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think we have X, Z kind of problems in, in our projects, but that's a valid pattern that we've got to be worried about. Um, well, by proxy, I don't mean a, Malicious maintainer. I don't even mean a sock puppet. I mean they'll just get someone yeah. that's not a maintainer to submit the PR instead of them doing it themselves. Right. It, 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 which is sort of malicious. <laughs> to be to be fair, right? It's it's not malicious in the. I'm trying to inject a hack, um, but it is malicious insofar as you're trying to get your way with an open source project that would not bad me. faith, we'll say bad faith. Is yeah, bad fine. faith. Yeah. I think it's yeah. working around software that GitHub maintains. Like two thirds majority should include the proposer if they have the ability to vote, right? Like, I think it's a bug. And it's it's a hack, as Bruce Schneier would call it, a hack. I, I don't think there's any negative connotation with having someone else submit a change so that we can have a maintainer approve it and get to a quorum. Because yeah. if, like, for arbitrary reasons, the author of the PR does not get included in the quorum on GitHub software, and I don't think that has anything to do with maliciousness. It's just arbitrary software decisions. Yeah. Yeah, also it can be an innocent thing where like, for example, I may have some mentorees that I'm trying to get to do more pull requests and I might, you know, give the, give the idea, maybe even some code to the person to check in, right? And then I would do the review and maybe an approve one of the approvals. Um, in, on, on some of these open source projects, we've actually got to the point where we would say um, we're in at least one of the approvers isn't from the same company, for example. Um, but we have the same issue about boats, right? Too many boats from one group or one, you know, one company. It should also be noted that um, as far as maintainers go, the owners also have the ability to merge. Chris, for example, can do merges usually on most of the open source projects. They have the ability, and I, I've seen where I've got the ability in some scenarios to move around yeah. things. I tend to look at this document as saying, here are the rules that I should be following before I ever click that button and override things. Okay. So this is where I'd like to have documentation written ahead of time that says, sure, Brandon had the ability to do that, especially I've used that over on the documentation side because very few people are ever looking at some of those other repos. It's nice to still get a couple of people getting second looks on things before I hit the button. And so I, I like having 
that written down if we could. All right, sounds like we all went quiet on this one. I I pulled up more just to kind of start the discussion. And I think before making a new PR, because I don't think VBATS wants to maintain this going forward if we decide to make changes, um, I'd want to know how we want to handle the inactive maintainer scenario. So I'd, I just kind of plant that bug in people's ears to think about and consider if you've got multiple maintainers that suddenly go inactive, we don't know about until we're trying to do a release. And then months later, we find out they haven't been doing anything for six months a year on the project and we can't get a release cut. Um, how is that resolved? So something to think about. All right, next one I had over on the image spec side, we've got a dependency on this Go JSON schema project. It was last touched about four years ago. It's got some old dependencies in there. They throw up some security alerts. Um, I don't think it's anything we're really that vulnerable to consider what we're doing, but it's still annoying to people that have to deal with those alerts. I was looking through, saw some other projects out there that were a little bit better maintained. Um, projects that are doing the same kind of stuff that we need to, just a JSON scheme of validation. So I was thinking about putting some work maybe this week or we'll see when I can get to it of doing a switch uh, and converting <clears throat> our validation code to use a different library. Just kind of want to give people a heads up on that, make sure there weren't any objections there. Okay, at least one person likes that. Thanks, Ajay. When we have something that hadn't been touched for about four years and all the dependencies are throwing errors and warnings and people are trying to submit PRs on us. Um, I feel like it's about time that we go ahead and maintain those. All right. Yeah, that was... yeah when, those were, when those were put in, they, were, they weren't well liked by the group. Right? Oh, yeah. This, and and this in. one, when when this was first put in, I'm pretty sure this, you know, it's got 2,000 plus stars. It was well imported by a whole lot of projects. It just got dropped off by the maintainer after we added it. Yeah, no, I mean, um, just using JSON schema validation in, entirely versus writing manual buckets. Um, we just didn't have enough time. So I think you could you could ask Vincent what the history was on that one, but I think at one point we were expecting it to go away or to be replaced. I mean, if the Go language itself includes something in the standard library, that would be nice. Wouldn't it? <laughs> I think it's good enough for us to still have a third-party dependency for just this one bit of code um, and update yeah. to something, something yeah, that's, that's better maintained. Yeah. Um, I don't want to rewrite ourselves. And I'm hesitant to say drop it entirely unless you have a good reason to not keep it in there. Rob, I see your hand up. There are other languages that support it in a native way. So maybe the right answer is to draft it in Java or some other language that, you know, is better <laughs> and provides it internally. Just saying. That That's just crazy talk. Ram, go, go ahead. Yeah, so this uh, some of these things are like core libraries, right? So I'm wondering whether we should just fork and adopt the fork inside our, uh, inside open containers itself. Um, that is one option. We could it means we're maintaining it, and I feel like it's us. Like, yes. I feel like us pointing to a new library <laughs> over here and them already doing the maintaining. If they're doing a good job maintaining it, I have no objection to using some of their work right now. I think we've already got dependencies to individual project maintainers code as well in here. Um, I think there's some stuff pointing over to VBATS or other people's repos as well. But yeah, yeah, just, I mean, just a thought there, yeah. Forking is always an option, um, but I would only want to fork it if it was unmaintained and we wanted to maintain it. And I feel like if it's unmaintained and someone else wants to maintain it, I'm happy to use someone else's.
Definitely an option, though. So this so, only impacts it in CI, right? Or does it? Um... This impacts in the image spec. Um, I guess I got to pick a PR on the here. In image spec, we have got the schema repo or schema folder, and there's a couple of imports of that in here and some of the validation codes of the validator that we ship that people can import. And so I think some people may have imported. It is also used when we um, run our CI as well, like you mentioned, that it goes through and checks all of the documentation that we write and make sure that all the documentation validates against the JSON, the JSON validates, vice versa. So between those two cases, I feel like we want to make sure that we're still supporting this just because this is code that people can import if they wanted to. They import the schema, yeah. Is there a read meter recommending that be done or not? I don't see. Okay. Be interesting if there was a root read me on that. <clears throat> or anything in our documentation describing this as a public API to be used. Just says that it's um, schema definitions in the validation function. So theoretically, someone could use this library to validate whatever they're accepting onto their registry. <clears throat> Okay. Not sure who is using it. Um, that we probably could look that up. Uh, I don't think we can because they're going to tell us everybody that has an import on the entire project. Mm. So we would know that other people are dependent on. Yeah, there's the vulnerability one. Is worry about. We would know that other people import the entire project, but we wouldn't know which thing they've imported. So I suspect almost all of these are just the the ghost specs themselves, not the schema. Right, working the whole thing. Yeah. So if no objections, I'll go ahead and put that on my to-do list. We'll see how quick I can knock that out. It might not be super quick, but something to something to clean up the repo. We've got an old PR sitting out there asking us to upgrade the indirect YAML dependency, and I feel like it's just better to go out, update the entire dependency and not just the one YAML library. So that was on the image spec. Over on the distribution side, um, this one caught my attention. It's been sitting out there a long while, but we don't have the API for a streaming patch request when you do a blob patch. The way that Docker, and I have a hint, I, I have a feeling of a fair number of other people have also done it. They do a, is it a post? I can never remember whether it is post or put. I think they do a post, they get the URL there, send in the blob to, and they do a single patch without a defined size, without a defined digest on it, stream all the bytes, and then when they get to the end, then they finally do the put at the end that says, here was the digest I sent you. So it doesn't have a content length, and it doesn't have multiple chunks. It's just one single large patch. That's the way... Docker does it today. We don't have that defined anywhere in our spec. And by saying Docker does it today, Docker has done that forever. So we've defined two different blob push options. One for the, well, three, I think. One if you do a monolithic, just send it straight to the post. One if you did a post and then a put. And one if you did a post, multiple patches, chunked patches and then a put. This is a fourth method, which is the post, a monolithic patch at that point, and then a final put. You might say it's three methods where post patch put is one to n patches. 
Yes. The difference in the, what this one was calling out was that in our spec, we say that you need to have the content length. And this was saying, well, not really. So it would be changing what the requirements are on that patch. John, your microphone always sounds so good. Got a radio voice going on there. I aim to please. So this one's been sitting out for a long while. I don't know if we want to approve this strictly as is. I feel like we need some more documentation on what happens when that field is omitted because there's other stuff that depends on it. There was a PR on the Continued East side for this as well. I don't remember if we pushed them back to OCI for this, um, but I don't remember what the specific concerns were about switching to chunked encoding. So can I, a while back, can we raise had a, a point PR. of confusion before we start talking about this, because there's terminology that's used a lot that is not interchangeable, but often we end up talking past each other where there's like transfer encoding chunked. And there's also multiple patch requests that we call chunked. And it's not entirely clear what we mean by chunked. Uh, I, I, want to I think that. in this case, it's transfer encoding chunked we're talking I about. Think so too. Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about yeah. is that we don't specify that explicitly. You might argue that we can fall back to HTTP for this, but I think having it as an example is probably worth having. So my understanding, if you go back to the other PR, that um, if the content length is set, that Go will not use the chunk transfer encoding. Is that what the PR is removing? Yeah. So because of that size is set, uh, Go ends up, I think that that probably ends up getting set into the request and then Go will not use the, the transfer encode, the chunked transfer encoding. I don't think there's anywhere today where we do chunked multiple patch requests. I think so... Standard, at least. So our spec defines the multiple patch request. Yeah, as a in in container DS. We don't use it. Yeah. And so I've tried to support this in some of my own fallback code because if you ever need to recover from something, sometimes it's nice to know there's a fixed length of day that you would need to go back to and recovering, um, especially if you're passing from a stream of input. We might support it for like resumable push, um, but it still tries to do the upload in one, mm -hmm. one patch request, one long patch request. But you've got the original source that you could always seek all the way back as far as you need to in that case, right? Yeah, yeah, we would just seek over what what's already there. I don't know that yeah. we do that today though. It's a scenario that a lot of registries don't support very well. And so I only do it as a fallback when things start to really fall apart. Um, and of course, users are the ones always raise PRs when they've got funky networks that are always falling apart. But yeah, we don't document this use case inside of the spec. We always assume that there is a content length size in there. And I think I had another objection for just removing that size, um, at least from the perspective of how that's getting removed, whether or not it's set in the HTTP request is kind of different. Like maybe this language is fine to omit it, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the way that it's getting done in container D is how we want to do it. So I, th I think we want that size. I, I certainly have use cases where I don't know the size ahead of time. I think that's what Docker was looking at too. They didn't know how big the 
stream of the tar and the compression and everything that was going to be before they started doing it. They just started the readers piping the tar into the compress into the blob upload directly. Yeah. I, I'm in favor of this uh, overall change. I'd like to link to relevant RFCs about transfer encoding if we can. Uh, uh, Derek, do you think, it, do you, is this like a point of contention you think? Do, should we require content length? No, it's not a point of contention. I was saying at least for the container D, it, it wasn't changing it in the request. It was changing it in one of our other objects. Um, but that's more like how Go is doing it because if if you set the length, if you know the length and you set the length, then the Go HP library will set content length and it will not use chunked encoding. But it seems like, well, maybe we want to be able to just use chunked encoding apart from whether or not we even know the length. Um, but that's that's kind of separate. That's not really like a spec issue. That's more like a specific Go issue or with our implementation. Um, the way, the language that he's proposing there, I mean, I almost don't see why it's necessary other than just saying, hey, you, you can avoid it. Like you can omit it, but there's nothing that says that it has to be there today. Yeah. So this is just cl just adding a clarifying statement that you don't have to set it. I, I think I have a problem with the spec in general is that like people read the examples as though they are the spec, even though they're non-normative. And so like people think, oh, this says you have to have content length, but there's not there's not any RFC language here that says like content length is a required field. Um, and so like lawyer hat on is like, this is fine. We don't need to change anything. But like practically, I think it would make sense to have somewhere in here call out like transfer encoding chunked and omitting content length as an example of like any request, you know? I think that will uh, alleviate a lot of confusion for people just looking at examples. Rom, you had a comment in the chat? About HTTP2 encoding? Ooh. Uh, you know, that's something I should probably know, but I don't. I'll look. I mean, how would, if it didn't support chunked encoding, then how would it work without the content length? Because the whole idea is that the chunk tells you, it's just, hey, here's a section of this length. Here's a section of this length, right? It's not a, otherwise, how do you know when you're done reading? I I believe it is not supported in HTTP two, but what do they do uh, in lieu of that? I don't know the answer to that. That I would have to look up. But I believe I am right. I mean, of course, trust but verify. But I believe chunk encoding, as it is uh, defined in HTTP one dot one, is not supported in HTTP two. So we have to be careful that we don't tie the uh, the transport behavior to the uh, the spec here. Uh, that's that's really my concern. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that, and it's it's really like language that shouldn't be in there. It's more like I would say clarifying language to say if this is something that's not allowed, but the example gives it, then we should say, hey, this is not required, and if you here's how it might behave in that case. I was kind of looking at this in general and thinking that we do say that. If you're going to upload it with the patch using this, it needs to have the following headers, and it doesn't doesn't have the capital must. But it, if I was someone reading this, I would assume that these were all required. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like I I understand why people are filing issues. Is that it makes sense? I I could understand if we said that it was optional, then the user would say, "Well, you never said that it was optional." It would need to be in the spec written down that that field was optional. And I think that's what they're doing in that PR is to specifically say that in the spec of, hey, we, we call this field out, but it is optional. If we do that, though, um, my comment in there was we also define content range. And if we take out content length, what is content range set to? I think that needs to be clarified, especially if you're recovering in the middle of a stream or something like that. What does that look like?
it seems like HTTP2 has an explicit into stream frame metadata thing. So it's not separate transfer encoding, but like a framing concern. I don't understand HTTP2 apparently, but I, I guess we should call out that content length can be omitted and maybe link to transfer encoding for HTTP 1.1 and whatever relevant section exists for HTTP 2. And is that going to be a, I'm assuming that's going to be a new PR on top of this or in lieu of this? Yeah, I think this is insufficient. Um, but I, I agree with the spirit of it. <laughs> I don't know. I, does anyone feel like they really actually understand HTTP two? <laughs> I don't. I understood Speedy at some point, and then HTTP two messed it up. And I'm like, screw it. I'm at three. Is like that? No, that's quick. Yeah, let's all try to go understand HTTP three. All right, it's quick is quick is too much for me. So in trying to complete this, um, I just kind of want to make sure, are we saying that the content range should be deleted from the request and that you can't recover in the middle? I, I, I think in practice you can't, but I do like that we specify it. It would be good if you could. What do we specify that you can put the star of the range and not the end? I mean, it would be weird to to do a range that's not actually at the end, right? If you you, you should be able to set a non-zero start, but the yeah, uh, yeah I guess you... I guess it'd be like the Docker case you were mentioning, where it's like, hey, I I want to use range. I don't want to start at the beginning. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense though, because if you don't have the, if you don't know the, if you don't know the end, then you shouldn't have like an arbitrary point to start at the beginning. That's not at the beginning. But... Well, I'm thinking of a recovery scenario where the connection dropped, you query the registry to find out how far it got, and then you resume from wherever you are. So this next request would also have that. Yeah, but then the the question is like, yeah, I understand for the resume case, but then what do you set the end of the range to? That, that's the question I'm asking is, would you leave it unset? And so it would be a number dash and blank, you know, end of line. Or what's the syntax what? for that? I, it doesn't have an option to have like an open range. Two numbers, number dash number. No open, nothing optional. Hmm. Is content length in that case not the length of the range, but the length of the whole content, or what is what is Con content, content length referred like to there? Length is of this single chunk, and chunk in terms of this patch request. Okay. And so, the length, if you took the start or the end minus the start should be the length. Um, I might have an off by one because there's an inclusive number in there, but roughly. Yeah, I guess if you don't set content length, you can't set content range. We should have two examples. And I, we could just, I don't know if, we, if it makes sense to link to transfer encoding. I mean, Go does the right thing by default. <laughs> I don't know. I forget what the, the specific issue was before around wanting to use chunked encoding over non-chunked encoding. There's something about some proxies or something with the content coming through. So there was a request a while back where, and I suspect that might have been the issue here, although this is not the change I thought I was going to see for that issue, where some reverse proxies in front of it. Um, they're talking about Cloudflare and other CDNs there. 
will not accept a single HTTP request above a certain size. And so you need to send smaller chunks. We already did that in the spec a while back. So I'm kind of surprised to see it going this direction where they didn't put that in there, but maybe the transfer encoding handles that automatically for you. As in the spec, we added a new header in there for that scenario. Um, OCI chunk min length. Well, this is a whole different problem. We got two different PRs on this one. The min length was for some backends of S3 that need a certain minimum size of each chunk. There was another PR asking us to put a max length because there were some some proxies that won't allow a packet or a, a request above a certain size. Just have the registry tell us what you want. I think that's what they were trying to do, but when they asked for the max length, we came back to this scenario of, okay, pretty much every Docker client today is already doing this. Um, it's tricky because you don't, you don't even, you don't always know because the, the CDN case might be you do the original post request to the registry and then the, you follow the location header to do the upload, which is now going through a CDN, which has like a different, yeah, it's messy. But it sounds yeah. like if everything just used HTTP2, it would be fine. Or HTTP3. As long as we're not trying to recover a previous session. And if we need to support that, then we just need to sort this out. Well, we didn't resolve what your what your first comment was on that is, can the range be open-ended? Can I say, hey, I want to begin here, but I don't know when it's going to end. If we can resolve that, I think we can make a new PR that handles everything everybody's asking for. So if we can solve that, great. If we can't solve that, then may we just say that, hey, these patch requests like this are not open-ended. If you ever need to recover, then you need to know the full length of the chunk. Yeah, and I don't think it's a good idea um, to just avoid content length just to try to trick the uh into using a different transfer encoding i think if you have the data you should send it um and sounds like http2 will work great there this whole thing of switching between chunked and non-chunked encoding is kind of a different piece can i ask a related question about the range header please do we know why we don't do it correctly? What's wait, which specifically is incorrect about it? I, I don't think range is a response header ever, but we shouldn't it be bytes generally? Like bytes are you equal? asking that asking yeah. this one here? Yeah. That seems not something normal, right? Yeah, I think you're right. And, and then what you're saying is the end of this sh should not be two numbers. It's a number, dash, number, and bytes. Uh, the general For requests, it's like bytes equals and then the range. Yeah. Is that, while we're in here, <laughs> I would love it if we could maybe say, do the right thing and not the thing that was in this document. But um, I don't know. I, I think that like trips up a lot of clients. Or what are, are the in... clients doing today, though? Are the clients doing it like this? I are the clients not... using this today? I well, I I have a client that does, but I'm weird, so maybe don't listen to me. I try to follow the spec to the letter, and because so many registries don't even support this at all, I keep it as a fallback. That I only hit this if I can't get the the blob to get uploaded any other way. So I'm I'm talking about download. Uh, path for range. Uh, a range request on the download. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think... I've, I've seen a registry not support when I do range bytes equals range. Uh, and that's awful because every other registry is redirecting to like an object storage, which only supports bytes equals. So maybe I'll file an issue. This, this is totally unrelated to what we're talking about, but uh, I want to bring it up because Derek's here and he knows everything. I think it would be good to say Amazing. that registry should support range colon bytes equals whatever. And that way, at least we have something in there going forward of saying, yeah, we document what you should do. It's not the must just yet, so it's not going to put a hard break on anybody that's not doing it today, but they should do that. Yeah. I mean, would they... Good. most of the time when the, when these large blobs are being fetched by range, though, they're not necessarily being fetched directly from the registry. They're being fetched from the CDN, so it's not like it's, it's not like the CDNs are supporting something that's specific to uh, OCI here. And, I mean, it works today. I mean, that's how lazy loading everything works today. Just doing yeah. spite requests. Right, that's what I'm using it for. Uh, so I have run into, I don't remember what it was, but when writing my lazy loading implementation, I ran into a registry that would return an error if I gave it range, like bytes equals and only worked without the bytes equals part. And I think it's because we have some examples here where we're using range. And Did non Brandon implement that registry? I I wish I could. I wish it's, I it's to the letter. Yeah. Definitely blame me if there's anybody to blame. But yeah, I think having in here something about requests with like the correct syntax with range might lay some groundwork for lazy stuff a little bit better. Yeah, that one is Sorry, a should and then like... getting registry. Yeah, getting registries to relax that parsing would be good, in my opinion. So I'm agreeing with you, John. Don't 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 break the ABI. Wait, we're only saying you should break the ABI. Because this is adopted by everyone in its incorrect form. What I'm what I'm proposing is registries should accept range request headers that have correct syntax, even if they accept incorrect syntax. Yeah, or we're, we're not saying a registry that implements this today, Rom. Uh, I can imagine. Why well, you we're on the this. we're we're on the upload section. Is the download section the same, or is it correct in the download section? I don't because know that it exists in the download section. Because in the download section, we know that it's working today correctly with CDNs. So ranges yeah, do work. Range is one of the things that was called in John's favorite issue. Range on downloads, that is. I linked two issues in chat where we discussed adding the bytes equals header to, or prefix to the range headers. And previously it was partially decided that we should not do so in order to avoid breaking compatibility. Which I think is neither here nor there. Yeah, I'm okay with not touching the response range headers because that's not even a neat thing in HTTP, as far as I can tell. I'm leaning towards still saying that registries must support our old bad syntax, but they should support the correct syntax. And that kind of gets us in the scenario where going forward, hopefully the registries can be upgraded and we can clean this up at some point in the V2 of some someday. Um, well, registries, what you said doesn't make sense to me because registries don't need to support this. Registries should not today support this syntax, I guess. So uh, I guess one does. Ah, it's terrible. It's terrible. Like the the one registry that I think does support the syntax did it accidentally because they saw a range in the like response header and they're like, oh, okay, that's the syntax, but that's not the syntax, right? And so, and it's on a response header and not a request header. And so 
I think we shouldn't even mention that because like if they do it, it's a bug. I, I was strictly thinking the request header, the response header, I'm not too worried about. Yeah. Cause we don't, we've never defined this in the request header in the incorrect syntax. And so I don't think we should say like, never should, John. Ah, uh, have you, you checked got me. the deleted you got spec me. contents? I don't know. It's possible. It's very possible. I'll go look. Oh man. One of you is going to have a link here in just a second. I'm sure. The fact that we have it on the push, though, I kind of feel like that that leads me to want to keep it similar. I'd, I'd want to keep the patch request and the get request matching between the different parts of the spec, internally consistent. You're right, Tina. Well, you're right for the first part, not the second part. The, the fetch blob example used to have range with the correct syntax in it and it no longer that example no longer exists i don't see anything with a request that has the incorrect syntax anywhere so john are you trying to push to say don't have the must on the bad version of the range request. That doesn't exist. There isn't a bad range request header. But and in terms bad. of keeping the two sections aligned and so to have uh, pulling blobs and pushing blobs have the same header between the two and not have a different version of the content range between the two. Well, content range is a whole different thing. Do we define content range for the for the get side at all? We don't. Which seems better because then it's just falling back to standard HTTP, which is why stuff works today for it. Yeah. I I would I think it would be okay if we just deleted the range response header, but maybe stuff relies on that. I don't know. For what it's worth, content range also canonically has a unit in it. It starts with unit and then space. So it will be content range bytes space start to end. Yep. Yeah, oh, exactly. but the, the examples didn't have that. Oh, this is terrible, huh? Yeah. I'm not even going to think about this. Wait, what? Oh, star. Yeah. yeah, the star is for the size, the length. Oh, but each which is the, the total length of the document or star if unknown. Yeah, but it's not saying for a single request if you don't know the overall length of that one request you're sending. It's right, but yeah. the overall length of the one request you're sending is the size of that content range, right? Like that's already implied. So it would be stupid to have another header that is just that value or another value that is just that. So that slash at the end is the size of the total document, not the size of this request. And it's only star if it's unknown, which in our case, any registry that can respond to a range request on a blob, but doesn't know the total size of that blob feels wrong. But that's us. We're the ones that did it wrong. Well, we defined the headers wrong several times. Yes. Well, even like outside of this, if you send a patch request and you don't know your overall content length, you just don't set it and you just keep going with that one long patch. Ooh. And so you. And so you don't know the length of your individual request. You don't know the overall length of the range that you're sending either. You can know the length of the range you're sending unless it's, uh, yeah, unless it's monolithic. In this case, you would omit the content range, I imagine. Okay, so we've got, we've got content range where we know the length, content length, 
content range where we don't know the length, and so we would omit it and content length. That's, I think, what Docker does today, right? They don't specify content length range or content length. We should definitely uh, document that, right? Because that's what Docker does. I want to know what happens with a content range when you don't know, especially in a, and this comes in as a bigger question if you're supporting a recoverable request. If you don't support recovering the request, um, a partial upload of some kind, then all this gets super easy. I don't know how you'd recover the request if you don't even know the full size of the object that you're recovering. Haha, -ha, but you do. It's in the spec. Um, after a 416 error, you can hit the location. And if you do a get on it, it's going to respond back and tell you exactly where you're supposed to be at. No, I mean, the registry knows, but in the case where the client doesn't even know how, like, I, so I that... generated 100 bytes of something and I sent it up and I don't know how many more bytes. And then now that's gone away. Now I have to... I'm regenerating and throwing away a hundred bytes. Like I don't have the original content in that case. That this assumes that you would have some kind of original content. So this assumes that you would have some source of the stream. If you and you'd had have that, the length, presumably you'd know. No, the you length. could yeah. you could cache an incoming stream locally, and then if you need to retry that, you can read from the cached source concatenated with the incoming stream you have not yet consumed based on what the registry tells you you successfully uploaded, right? And in my own case, when I do this, I buffer. I intentionally buffer in memory, and then I never throw things out of the buffer until I know the registry has accepted it. But that assumes that I know the length of each individual patch. I missed y'all. This is such a fun time every every time I join. So much fun. Oh, man, we... We went right to the end of the hour there. Yeah, if you, if you did that route, I would think you'd want to just do multiple patch requests, which I, luckily nobody I do in my did. scenario. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay with not being able to recover on the monolithic patch. I think that's fine, right? That that knocks a lot of the problems out at that point, then yeah. I think that's fine, because no one cares anyway. We're just kind of arguing about yeah. stuff for fun. So in that case, content range goes away, content link goes away. And we just support a patch without any of those. And then we just say that if you're doing that, follow the HTTP specs. Is that the TLDR there? Seems like we've just got ourselves into trouble when we've tried to redefine what's in HTTP instead of just leaving it undefined. And then it just seems to work when we do that. Don't blame me, I voted for Kronos. Sounds like a good plan. All right. Joey, this is one of our more productive meetings. We're not usually as good. Don't don't get your expectations too high here. I think All you right. guys have been uh, delightful so far. So. All right. Well, on that note, I don't know if we have any specific action items other than maybe I'll go out and work on a couple of different things. Maybe some folks want to submit a PR too, but um, otherwise until next week, I think we've at least got some progress made. Memorial Day weekend, take off. Yeah, yeah. have a great long weekend for those in the US. And for those I... not in the US, enjoy a Monday without crazy people on your meetings. Right. <laughs> Bye. Cheers all. Okay. Bye.